Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming to the Legatum Institute uh, on this very chilly evening. Um, I'm really very pleased to have uh, two extremely distinguished economists this evening uh, who are going to talk about one of the thorniest problems that the world post Obama's election, actually before Obama's election, faces, namely what might or what could or what ought to happen next in Syria. Uh, most of you know uh, both of the people on the panel. One of them, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, who is now chair of the Transition Commission in Afghanistan and chairman also of the Institute for State Effectiveness, which is an institute he and Claire run in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was part of the Afghan transition from 2002 onwards. He helped create the bond agreement, sorry, 2011 on, 2001 onwards. Uh, he cre helped create the bond agreement. Uh, he served as Afghanistan's finance minister. Um, he, he's been the, 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 the most, um, uh, the most important critic and the most important advisor on American and other foreign efforts to, 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 to push forward the transition in Afghanistan. Um, one of his partners and colleagues all through this was Claire Lockhart, who is the co-founder and the other director of the Institute for State Effectiveness, um, also director of the Market Building Program at Aspen Institute. Claire has been working on um, making ropey countries and ropey economies improve all of her life. We were speaking this <coughs> afternoon about trips that she made to Vorkuta in the northern, uh, very far north of Russia in the 1990s. And so her, her, her experience ranges really from Afghanistan to Russia um, to Africa and almost, almost everywhere else in the world. Um, she's been chairman of the Fragile States Council of, for the World Economic Forum. Um, both she and Dr. Ghani are heading off to the World Economic Forum in Dubai uh, just after this, tomorrow, I think, even after this meeting. Um, the genesis of the evening really is a series of conversations I started with Claire a few months ago about Syria. And you will see in front of you um, or, or on your chairs a copy of the report that she and Ashraf have written. And the report is an attempt to talk about the Syrian transition before it's happened and which may seem a, a little bit pie in the sky, but as, as I think they'll explain the, the thinking behind it. And the idea is these that we have in front of us two people who've worked on and studied and carefully examined transitions from all over the world. That's what, they're, that's what the Institute for State Effectiveness has been doing for the last several years. And they are beginning to draw lessons from the past and draw lessons from other regions and from other uh, situations. And they would like to, st and they, the, the, the idea of this report is that they have started to think in advance of how they might apply to Syria, um, what kinds of uh, what kinds of changes might we expect in, in Syria? What are the possible scenarios for change um, under certain circumstances? What what will be the best methods uh, to use, um, and and what might not work? Um, they are both neither is a Syria expert, as I think they will tell you, and their their interest is slightly different. They're interested in comparing and contrasting um, events in Syria to other places, and they're probably people in the room who are Syrian experts, and that's why we're hoping that in the course of this conversation, uh, you'll, have a, you'll talk to them and, and, and be able to exchange information. Um, I'm not gonna speak very long. Um, I'm definitely not a Syrian expert, but I run the small program on transitions here, and, and that's, that's the explanation for me being here. Um, I will start with Ashraf Ghani, who we decided this afternoon would briefly introduce this project in his own words. First, so. good evening, and uh, first of all, many thanks to you and uh, and to Lagatum. Uh, as you indicated, this paper is a result of a series of conversations, three-way, you directly with Claire, and then on the phone. Mm -hmm. And thank you for forcing us to write it, <laughs> because my first reaction was, we'll offer some ideas, but. Uh, we are not Syria experts, so that, that really needs to be underlined. I want to begin with differentiating three types of perspectives. One is the perspective of an engaged actor. Every member of a community has views, passionately held, and when a country is consensus, those turn into a way forward. When those views reach a clash, there is rupture. 
And, and in that kind of situation, it's extremely difficult to see then their common future because they're so engaged in a rupture with the past that to get them to focus on the future is very difficult. Second is an internal, external interested view. There's the UN, there's the UK government, there's the US government, the Turkish government, etc. These are interested stakeholders with the nature of their stakes determined by medium or long or short term perspectives, but mediated through bureaucracies. The institutional mechanism through which interest is mediated needs to be recognized because those have advantages, but also blinders. We have seen the failure of these institutional perspectives in Iraq and Afghanistan with clarity. They do not possess wisdom a lot of times, uh, because, but they are interested stakeholders and their views make an enormous difference. So understanding of their views and hopefully triggering debates that those views reach convergence are important. Our view is neither. We are neither internal actors. You know, in the case of Afghanistan, I'm an internal actor, uh, and others clear it. Uh, nor connected to these larger institutional interests. What we are bringing is a perspective focused on emerging patterns, where the interaction of these two sets of actors produces consequences, and both intended and unintended consequences. Because what is important is not only to look just at the intended consequence, but at the unintended consequence. And in the case of Syria today, to very briefly frame some issues, particularly in, the, in uh, post yesterday, uh, with the results of the US. First, our reading is that conflict internally is dynamic. What that means is until today, the opposition does not have the capability to overthrow the government. But simultaneously, the government does not have the capability to repress the opposition. These type of dynamic conflicts can be immensely costly for the population concerned. Lebanon next door, through 1975 to 1990, is an example of the type of price uh, that a society endures in Lebanon's civil war did not resolve any of the structural issues that Lebanese society faced. There was a compromise. So it, it's important to understand that when we say dynamic, it does not mean frozen, and it does not have one end in view. Second, at the international level, there's a stalemate manifested in two important arenas. One, a decade of resort to use of force by the United States for regime change is over. The Obama administration has made crystal clear that it's not going to resort to a massive use of force as an instrument as a constant instrument of US policy. But in the wake of it, what instruments are available are still open. Simultaneously, at the Security Council of the United Nations, there's both distrust regarding intentions and lack of fundamental agreement on how international peace and security uh, is to be dealt with. Russia and China or in a new position. And, and in that regard, we are seeing a type of struggle among major powers in the Middle East that reminds us, not exact analogies, but reminders of the 1950s and 60s. Thirdly, in the 1950s and 60s in Syria. In Syria, mm -hmm. yeah, in Syria. Thirdly, there are regional issues that cannot be separated from the internal issue. 
Iran is a very, very significant player. There's an excellent recent book that got released a couple of months ago called The Toll-Like War by a man called Chris that takes stock of the 40 years of on-again, off-again confrontation between Iran and the United States. And of course, that is implications, as does the Lebanese internal situation and the balance of power. And on the other side is Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, the Gulf at large, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. The net balance of this is that conflict can now be maintained. But will there be a resolution? A resolution that can allow uh, for a structural set of, of solutions. <clears throat> so to summarize it, the situation is complex. What is characteristic of complex situations versus complicated situations is that complicated situations are very many pieces. But the outcome is, is more clear. Complex situation by definition or about uncertainty. And we are in a period of high uncertainty. If we are to deal, so how does one deal with uncertainty? And this is where maybe our relevance uh, comes, is to develop a, a discipline of scenarios. Scenarios are harnessed because they are not about prediction. They are about probabilistic outcomes that can emerge from a range of interactions. And because of it, one needs to look at drivers of scenarios, triggers of scenarios, and factors and actors that determine various uh, situations. And one scenario that we have not discussed in detail, of course, is the survival of the Assad regime with us. Four that we have discussed uh, and then if there were questions, we could elaborate on, but just as signposts. One is an Assad regime without us. The reason this is important is a lot of the times in questions of transition, there's an illusion that you begin with a green field, that it's a brand new clean slate. Our experience of review of more than 100 cases Worldwide shows that there is no green field. The nature of the ancien regime matters. There's a legacy. The past cannot be dismissed. It needs to be reframed and overcome actively. And Yemen is an indication, in, as is Egypt, of both continuity and change, because it, it starts opening a, a, new, a new dynamic. A second. Uh, probability is an elusive piece. And I'll, what needs to be brought to your attention is 50% of the peace agreements globally that have been signed within five years of faith. So a temporary accommodation does not mean <coughs> that you've reached. Uh, political processes are inherently reversible. They require work uh, to move up. It's like climbing a very steep mountain. And a lot of times, both the international community and local actors think that they've arrived at the plateau and stopped working. But till one arrives at stability, it, it really requires focus. So elusive peace is, is an important uh, part that, that we need to recognize as, as, the, as, a, potential as a potential scenario. The third one. Uh, is a new beginning. And, and in the case of new beginning, particularly, uh, we'll come back to probably one of your questions, both how the past is interpreted and how the future is envisioned, and what type of leadership and management and relationships are put are going to matter. And here, it's the partnership of both sides. What do exile groups, particularly that have time on their hand, can best do 
uh, to come with vision. A lot of diasporas, at times are frozen in terms of their images of a particular time in which they left their country. They are deeply and passionately concerned, but their images are of a particular time. And validation of that image requires a lot of work and, and effort. But the other part is that you have a dysfunctional international world. To think that uh, there is a functional UN or etc. and count on it, it will be extremely difficult. So it's going to require a tremendous amount of work. And then the last part is an imposed peace. An imposed peace emerges when the cost of the CNN appearances of tragedies reaches a point where psychological barriers are crossed. We've seen a lot of tolerance uh, for the price that the Syrian people are paying. The cost, you know, there's been a lot of concern about cost of intervention, but what one needs to simultaneously look into is tolerance of the current tragedy. And the cost of non-intervention. And the cost of non-intervention and the type of, of political agreements that are uh, required for this. Because it's not cost free. I mean, the level of casualties, what point has it reached? The level of destruction of the financial capital, the social capital, the human capital uh, of, the, of the country. So all of this needs to be put uh, together. And then we draw very specific lessons, but I'll stop there because there might be specific questions and Claire could uh, uh, comment on some of that issue. Thank you very much. The, the scenarios that um, Ashraf describes are, are, are described in greater detail in the paper as well. Um, Claire, could you talk a little bit about when you were doing the work for this paper? What, we, we, just to say that we spoke this afternoon about how the nature of a particular regime um, determines, uh, determines what kind of comparisons and what kind of examples from the past you would look for. Um, when you work on Syria, which countries, which other situations did you, did you find most useful, as either as precedents for things to do or things not to do? Certainly. And as Anne mentioned, um, we've had the privilege through our, our work over the last years at ISE to look at a number of different peace agreements from the last three decades, different kinds of transitions, and different kinds of efforts at, at state building. Um, and the first question we looked at was what are the objectives or themes that a peace agreement could be con constructed around? We found that there are generally four types of, of objectives. And the first, which we find very relevant for Syria, is, is the nature of the state and the, the extent to which it is oriented around making the state inclusive, recognizing the rights of all citizens on, on an equal basis. And there, it's the examples of Colombia, of Guatemala and El Salvador that we found most, most relevant. Because, because, can you just elaborate for one second on, on those countries? Why are those? Yes, in, in, in those peace agreements, it was really the question of, of instead of a, a minority being persecuted, they became part of an inclusive state where their rights would be recognized alongside others. So as the constitution the core of the was agreement. rewritten and so Yes. The second is sometimes that, that sense of per persecution or minority is met through, through decentralization. Uh, and there, it's Aceh within Indonesia, it's Mindanao in the Philippines, and within Europe, Croatia, Georgia, Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro. It was a, a, a formula of decentralization that met the, the exclusion and, and the drivers of conflict. When um, a, a third case is when order is broken down to such an extent that the framework of rule of law is not cannot be rescued. And there it's the case of Sudan with the comprehensive peace agreement that really was comprehensive that provided a basis. Um, and you know, while, it, while the comprehensive nature was an advantage, it also presents an enormous challenge in, in implementation. It's a multi-year negotiation process and a multi-year implementation process. Um, a final set of attempts were about creating a legitimate center where the, the center has lost all authority, all legitimacy with the population needs to be rebuilt, often with quite a heavy hand of an international presence and, and Afghanistan, Cambodia and, and East Timor and are examples of that. Second thing we looked at was the role of the mediator and it's set out in the paper, I'll touch on it briefly here. Okay. Oh, 
But can I just ask, for, before you go on to the role of the media, the, of those kinds of peace agreements, the most appropriate for Syria, you think your judgment is the first kind? Or, or is it too early to say? It, it's too early to say. There may be elements <coughs> of each of them. It does seem that one of the, the, the key, or one of the key, if not the key questions, is going to be the question of an inclusive state that recognizes all, all citizens. And what we've argued is um, that there'll be a choice. I mean, does Syria become a secular republic like Turkey? where a Muslim majority unites around ties of citizenship? Will it create a sectarian compact like Lebanon, or will it become a, a Sunni-dominated regime where sectarian and ethnic minorities will become marginalized? And that's, that's a choice. And it would seem that the most stable of these would be the first. Um, but as analysts, we're stopping short of, of recommendations and pointing out the different examples. Mm -hmm. So second set of questions we looked at was what kind of, of mediation, what kind of negotiator might be a, appropriate and what approach, what style would they bring to, to possible negotiations? Um, and we found different approaches have worked in different contexts. Sometimes the media works with a narrow group of individuals. Sometimes they it usually takes much longer. They work with much broader stakeholders over a long period of time, have a broader range of issues for discussion. Um, sometimes the negotiations can be very rapid with agreement on a key set of principles, but then a much longer process of, of dealing with other issues over time. Um, the Bonn Agreement in Afghanistan, which was concluded in just two weeks, but allowed a framework for dealing with other issues later, is one example of this type of approach. Um, a peace agreement in Nepal, again, le left mo many difficult issues for resolution later. Um, others rely on a new type of politics with political parties. Um, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua as examples of, of those. We also looked at a set of, of operational issues where, you know, given that 50% of peace agreements do fall down, do revert to conflict, um, what are the issues that are, that are terribly important to get right? And we found that often it's about keeping the content narrow and defined, trying to be too comprehensive, all-encompassing, um, contains the seeds of, 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 of breakdown later on, the Cambodian peace ag agreement as an example there. Um, the question of short-term trade-offs, versus long-term stability? What kind of accommodations um, are necessary to bring peace, but then within those accommodations contain the seeds of, of conflict breaking out in, in the future? And I think we saw many examples in, in Africa where the accommodation of strongmen and attempts to incorporate them within the formal structures of government um, created the basis for the diversion of resources of the state in another round of conflict later and how is that balance to be struck is one of the toughest questions for, for, any, for any negotiator, any process. The questions of when is it that sovereignty gets recognized? Um, how is it that an initial focus on negotiation um, doesn't take so much of the energy and resources that, that the hard work of implementation is, is ignored? Questions of resource mobilization. We found again and again that economics is often something that's left for later. Um, in a series of interviews we conducted with SRSGs, Special Representatives of the Secretary General of Peace Agreements, many of them said that their biggest regret was thinking that economics can wait till later because they found it was the failure to get economics right that meant the resources weren't there to underwrite the promises of a peace agreement, young men didn't have jobs, and a criminal economy formed, which again contained the, the seeds of conflict. Finally, issues of civil society and citizenship. If there's a narrow agreement when military factions are turned into owners of the political process, does this recreate the very kinds of marginalization which inspired a, a first <coughs> round of, of, of opposition? We then, in, in the paper, then set out which are the lessons from these agreements that would pertain particularly for Syria. And we've, we've recommended that um, however the issues are constructed, a set of working groups to tackle them over time to build consensus will be very important. Some of this is work has started in, in groups like the um, United States um, USIP Day After Project. There have been other initiatives, but how is that process to be deepened and, and sustained? And we've set out a number of issues that, that we would think, based on these examples, um, would be important to be addressed by such working groups. The first, the legal framework. What type of legal framework, a constitution, primary, secondary legislation, questions of transitional justice, and laws particularly for use of force, for property rights, and for political parties and elections. Um, second, how is security to be provided during a transitional process? And what's the right balance between army and police? Third, the, the internal reorganization of this, the state. 
and very much as Dr. Ghani has, has emphasized, that realizing that it's not a blank slate. So starting instead with an institutional map of what's already in place and how can this be built upon um, rather than assuming that, th that there can be a fresh, fresh beginning. Um, questions of media and access to information, questions of public finance and organizing resources. The budget is the central instrument of policy making. How are civil servants to be paid in the short term so that a breakdown in, in law and order and functioning of the state doesn't um, become, become exacerbated? And, and many countries have had um, positive experience in setting up a, tr a trust fund early, which can uh, bring together streams of, of, of flows of funding, but also set very <coughs> clear rules of the game and conditions for how that, those resources are to be used. Social and economic development, again, not something that can be left till later, uh, but not, not only questions of organization of the economy, but social development and, and addressing the very real challenges of, of the psychological dimensions and, and trauma. There are immediate stabilization measures and then relations with the, with the international community. We've set these out in more detail, but uh, look forward to, to discussing, okay. hearing your comments. Claire, can you, when, you, when you're describing uh, these things that should be done, do I understand you saying that these should be done now? I mean, should the, is the are these committees, are these studies, are these, is this work the international community could be doing now? before we have a peace agreement. Yes, and, and, and what, what we found is that um, often there's a large degree of, of improvisation. Um, the conditions for a peace agreement may not arise for some time, mm. but if they do and when they have ris arisen unexpectedly, there's a large degree of improvisation and many agreements um, have had huge, extraordinary lacuna because these issues weren't sufficiently thought through in advance because sufficient consensus wasn't built across the relevant groups. So I feel that there is an, uh, not only an opportunity, but a, a need. The, the more that the issues can be thought ahead of time, the more likely that it is that the consensus can be built um, and key issues aren't left till later. Do, do you agree with that? Is that your Yes, of course, because, I mean, look, it's South Africa. The place where scenarios were used in the most constructive way to avoid an enormous set of potential conflicts was in South Africa. Uh, what is critical is that actors that are key to the solution, both internally and externally, arrive at an understanding that there's a day after conflict. And if that common fo focus does not develop, then everybody perpetuates a zero-sum game. A society, by definition, needs to agree that it has something that it is more in common uh, than what divides them. And to reach understanding on what unites them, uh, potential is extremely important. But it also is a balance between what is feasible and what is desirable. A lot of the times, people of spend enormous amount of time about what is desirable without thinking through what is feasible. And then what sets of actions makes a group of people that suddenly are brought to power in the event of a transition acquire credibility? Credibility comes from preparation. <coughs> transition situations are inherently about risk. It's not the risk that cannot be foreseen. It is risk management that is critical. And risk management comes from the degree of preparation, from the range of examples, because they, the problems that they are going to be encountering, it's at one level are going to be unique. But about 80% of them are not going to be unique. These are going to be routine problems of creating order a uh, building, for instance, you know, so much is destroyed. How you build is something in which enormous amount of resources can be lost, or with focused attention, enormous amount of credibility can be built to, to ensure that there is a focus on the needs of the citizens. Also, in this case, uh, there are significant, you know, the nature of the conflict, we read about 4,000 pages of recent and historical reflections 
to be able to offer a characterization of both the regime and the emerging opposition. Should that, those, that reading be placed different than our Syrian colleagues or best uh, positioned to clarify those assumptions, then the nature of the consequences would be different. Mm -hmm. And it's also what triggers what. Because ultimately, all conflicts are resolved by acknowledging that neither party can win. <clears throat> Without that acknowledgement, Transition does not happen. Because then it's a victory. It's not a transition in, in one sense. And all the cases that we've pointed out have reached a particular moment. And these were long-term uh, conflicts. When Claire was mentioning earlier, Guatemala or El Salvador or Sudan, thousands of people died. Uh, two sides were locked in a battle. And when an acknowledgement came that politics was to replace violence, then intense types of discussions uh, took place to bring about that middle ground where significant agreement could, could take place. And some of these have held, others did not. Uh, but part of the issue, like Sudan, was also in agreement uh, regarding uh, a divorce that could be part of that. Syria does not offer the possibility of a divorce. You know, this is a nation with a very proud history and understanding. Disturbing of the Middle Eastern map is not going to be one of those things that is really going to be on the table. So that the nature of internal exercise of power, how power is exercised, how institutions are shaped, for instance, the military. The nature of the military in its relate balance with the police is going to be one of the most important determinants of how stability could might be shaped, could become feasibly reached, etc. Um, I have a, a whole list of topics and so on to, to, to discuss, but I think I'm actually going to take questions and comments now, just so that you all know this there are, in this room there are a number of people who are very active in the Syrian diaspora. There are also some UK government officials and others. Um, so there's a, there's a broad range of experience here. Does, would anybody like to start with a question or a comment for either of our guests, both of them? Sir, and could you say who you are? Yes. Chris Doyle from the Council for Arab British Understanding, and uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I missed the earlier part of your remarks, but uh, I, I couldn't uh, agree more with a lot of what you said. I want to ask one issue in Syria, and forgive me if you'd covered it, but the issue of the region, because I know it's mentioned in the paper here. It, it, it seems to me that the, that the region has various actors who are participant in this conflict, some overtly by supporting one or the other side, and some even arguably actually wanting the conflict to continue at this stage. And I, and I think this actually has exacerbated the situation. It's made it harder to find a, a, a solution, and it's certainly made it harder for the Syrian opposition, uh, in exile at least, to gather together to, to, uh, to work together and so forth. How does one actually try to get uh, the region also to accept uh, uh, the need uh, and the road forward to a full agreement, a full peace agreement and transition? Do you want to answer that or take another question? Or do you why don't you answer it? Okay. I think this is extremely significant. So, so let us uh, thank you uh, for uh, basing. First, a bit of historical perspective. Regional powers have a tendency of shifting conflict away from their own territory and transporting it to a third place. Syria of 1950s was a site of struggle among contending uh, forces. What the Assad father regime brought was to turn Syria into a contender for regional importance. And that is an important legacy of that, that regime. And its role in Lebanon was precisely to transport conflict from Syria into Lebanon. And 15 years of Lebanese conflict was because at times in a week, $100 million were pumped into the conflict. Yemen of 1960, 
is another example where Nasser got bogged down. Iraq is another example. Uh, so I think the, the first issue is we need to bring the historical perspective that a Syria that becomes a battleground will not be confined to Syria. It will spell out. Uh, so in terms of regional perspective, it is crucial uh, to develop a regional consensus uh, that a common approach is developed regarding stability in Syria and not continuation of conflict. And in that envi environment, there are two contending actors with very different sets of views. On, on the one hand, the Turkish model and what are the limits of one neighbor in this regard, and the other is zero. Uh, and without engaging both actors and the, that immediately are engaged. The other is the very significant role of the Gulf. Gulf economically is a transformative power. You know, I mean, what Qatar has done in terms of its economic planning is unbelievable. In Syria? No, you mean, in, in internally. General? Internally, Qatar's transformation or Abu Dhabi's transformation or Dubai's transformation. Because we, we are stuck with an image of the past in these countries where we think you know, these are authoritarian regimes without capability for vision. I mean, if you take the use of the balanced scorecard, no government has gone as far as the government of Qatar in terms of this or the government of or Abu Dhabi in terms of... So there are sets of capabilities, but simultaneously, externally, there are regional powers that could embrace narrow sectarian ideas and if those more sectarian nature of patronage prevails over their own experience of how to bring stability, they could, the risks of perpetuation uh, will, will increase. So in summary, there are two dimensions. One, how can a regional internal consensus be built, particularly the Arab a region, because it is an interconnected <coughs> set of politics. Second, how can the regional and the international actors coordinate so more coherent approaches are, are developed? If these two are not tackled, the risk that you've identified will substantially increase. And the people of Syria, in the region, will pay. And then one thing we've learned about these conflicts, this blowback the region does not remain immune. So to think through that the conflict in, in, the, in Syria could remain confined and all the problems be transported there, I think is wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, disagreements? Nothing? Uh, one, wait, sorry, one there. Yes. Ben Amanazi, formerly of the Arab League of London. Um, what, what, what can you do as a regional or um, international context within that context? If the actual, uh, sorry, if the actual parties to the conflict are still convinced that they can achieve success by force, by military means, and so forth, to what extent um, can the those the neighbourhood? Uh, succeed in offering a different scenario when the parties themselves, the protagonists, still believe in, the, in an outcome that is, you know, uh, zero sum game. So, so the, so the, in other words, the parties to the conflict, sure. both sides still think they're going to win. Exactly. How, no. yeah, so, how, how do you convince them that they're, neither one is going to win? Well, one, to be very blunt, is money. 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 Money in yes. what? The government, how does the government finance itself? You know, it's running out of money. Second opposition. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, by the way, um, agree to that. It no, no, it, 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 them saying no, absolutely. The is great and no, no, but, but those are, yep. mm. there's a pattern. Every single government before it reached the point of acknowledging that it needs serious peace, it says everything is granted. Yeah. But second, the opposition also is financed. So 
there are significant instruments in this regard. Conflict is expensive. Arms are being smuggled. Smugglers demand prices. Uh, the regime needs, if, if one looks at the financial base of the regime, sanctions are hurting. Uh, now they would need to use their accumulated resources. Uh, so there are costs. But the, the fundamental issue here is, is also what I was bringing earlier. It's the nature of the compromise. Because when two parties, each to a conflict, each thinks that they can win, and in order to win, they're willing to pay the ultimate price, which means destruction of many, many lives, it's extremely difficult to bring it. What the, the region and the international community can do is to emphasize the feasible. What, what is important? Where can points of co compromise really develop? Uh, the Alawites cannot be washed away. What is the agenda of the opposition regarding assuring the Alawites that they're going to be parts of Syria? What, you know, it is extremely difficult in, in a situation where members of the government have used force, including air power, to destroy a lot of houses to ask people to think about the after, <coughs> the, the day after, uh, or etc. But unless the region brings that perspective, that how long is this destruction to continue? So it is, I think, in those areas, uh, one, the re for the region, it's extremely important at least to develop the modicum of one voice. The region is speaking with multiple voices mm. regarding what, what is possible and what is not. Two, the, the international community has become observers because of their own stalemate. Yet, there are sets of, of actions that are taking place that, ki that can keep the co conflict going. The cost of this approach now really needs to be carefully analyzed and its consequences explained. Is this really low intensity conflict or is this going to spill out? Mm -hmm. and, and what would be its consequence? Claire, another tool that we talked about that the international community has um, is the possibility of recognizing a provisional government, you know, delegitimizing de the current regime by recognizing um, uh, another group. We were saying you were saying there were there are pros and there are cons. Do you, can you talk a little bit about that? Or the, is there is there would that make a difference to the to the conflict? Could that help resolve it more quickly? Um, it, it could have some advantages. It, could, it also certainly has many risks. And I think the, the kind of provisional government that is being talked about at the moment could have the advantages in producing some kind of the regional and international consensus and, and uniting flows of money and, and conditions for how support is delivered. Um, on the other hand, it could become a provisional government in exile without prospect um, of gaining legitimate authority within the country um, and, and not be a vehicle for, for bringing the conflict to a resolution. Um, and we've seen that example in another context where provisional governments are formed um, in exile but remain in exile. And is there a special role that the diaspora can play or, or, is, or, are, they, or are they by definition not can't be part of this? I think so. And as we've looked at other contexts, the diaspora have enormous amount of... Um, <coughs> wisdom, of capabilities, of resources to bring to a context, yet, and as we see in Syria, they're very different from many have lived outside the country for years, if not decades, and we've seen that often, um, well, a, a future of the country cannot write only on the diaspora, and we're seeing increasing divergence between the, the diaspora um, and then those within who are, who are risking their lives, but also... Um, gaining authority within the context. So how is it that the diaspora relates to and what kind of, whether it's a provisional government or, or some kind of future government, how is it the talents of the diaspora um, are combined with um, representation of those on the ground is going to be one of a, a very, very key questions. 
Anybody want to say something? Yes, behind you, you behind Mr. Doyle. So. Gabrielle Rifkin, Oxford Research Group. Um, can I pick up Ashraf's um, point about the different instruments that one has? And if, we're talk if we think about the supply of weapons, and suppose we think it's a good idea to, to try and prevent the supply of weapons into the country, how do we deal in the first instance with the asymmetry that this actually creates? The fact that the state already has weapons in the fight. That's number one. And if we agree it's a good idea to stop the supply, how do we do it? I mean, first of all, any situation, I was not advocating a one-sided action. I was just describing the range of instruments. When peace comes, when a peace agreement takes place in the past, there's mutual understanding first and foremost, on restructuring of the security institution. Without reaching an agreement through regional mediation. And if you look into Latin America of 1980s versus Latin America of 1990s, in Latin America of 1980s, there was no regional agreement. The conflicts in Central America flared up and continued massive, with massive destruction. In 1990s, a set of common perceptions developed and the region played an extremely active role in bringing an end. Be because the region came to understand that it was the, not in their interest. In, not in their interest. What about hmm. really early on, though? Suppose at the beginning we tried to do something on the flare of weapons, because you know, we're talking about a decade on it came to that. Again. No, I mean, but this is the lesson of history. I mean, the point I think that we're bringing because uh, you have written and been an advocate of a standing table type of uh, agreement. We need multiple conversations to take place. These conversations need to be focused. They need to bring about different implications of the current courses of action, because what I'm afraid we are seeing is uncoordinated set of actions, reactive reactions to events, rather than in understanding of the limits of the possible, focusing on the potential. A lot of very strong verbal standing, but not followed by feasible actions. And, and what is important in the dialogue between the regional actors and international actors, again, is the sense of feasibility. Because when the two have not been aligned, look, to keep a conflict Raging requires as little as $100 million a year. To bring genuine peace to a raging conflict requires statesmanship. It is in many actors, both private and state, have the capability to keep a conflict going. But the other type which, which is extremely important, is, is to be able to think through some of these parameters regionally and internationally. Claire, you spoke earlier about the, the nature of mediation. Um, in this particular conflict, it, can, where would the best mediators come from? Would they be in the region? Would they be international? Should they come from the UN? Should they come from the US? I mean, who has authority to, to negotiate in Syria? do you think? And I, I know that's an, a very hard question that many, many people are, are, are actively thinking through and thinking about. And it's clear, of course, with the current um, stalemate within the UN. And, you know, the, the UN is often the first port of call and has tremendous, exp you know, despite the number of failed peace agreements, has ex tremendous expertise, wisdom, and experience. So the UN would be a contender. But while the, the stalemate and, and the blockages remain, it's, it's not immediately on the table. But that certainly would be a... Um, a preferred option um, should the diplo should di diplomatic imagination and, and leadership emerge such that the UN becomes possible. Um, the Arab League is, is, is certainly um, another option, um, or some kind of um, particularly regionally-led coalition um, that can work with different groups within Syria. And as, as we've heard in the previous discussion we had here, here at Legatum, and, and as we've heard, you know, how is it that internal constituencies can work with regional and international coalitions? So what's the alignment between them? And is there some form of 
um, unique way of bringing different actors together through a kind of mechanism, as, as Gabriel Rifkin has, has written and talked about it, a standing table or a conference that can, can bring those forces into alignment um, is the question. But, but formal, formal organizations, the Arab League or, or the UN, um, should the blockages change? And not the United States. Um, <laughs> certainly the US will have a, a major, if not critical, role in, in moving forward. But as, no, um, I, I, I'm, as I'm the convener, <laughs> I, I think the US will be the first to say that, that, that I, that's I'm not laughing, on the table. Claire, Claire and I were at a lunch where a group of Syrians finally um, were arguing with us, and one of them banged their fist on the table and said, the US needs to come in here and organize this. And all you know, and everybody at the table said, "No, you know, so, <laughs> well, what makes you think we'd be good at doing that?" You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question. Somebody wanted to speak back there. Uh, yeah, um, thank you very much for the discussion so far and the presentations. Uh, my name is Malcolm Russell. I was previously with the Foreign Office, uh, now an independent consultant on governance and political reconciliation to a, a number of public sector and, and private sector organisations, and also academic researcher in these areas. Um, I just wanted to say I was interested in the discussion earlier about the, um, the continuation of violence. Um, I, I will distinguish that from conflict in a moment, if I may. The, um, uh, because at least one side believes that they, they can prevail. But is it not also the case, and perhaps even more strongly the case, that neither side feels they're able to, to lose? Um, that, that's what's driving the conflict forward. Um, and I think partly um, the reason for that is because the, the opposition are united only in one thing, that is, in opposition. They haven't yet united towards a common future. And because that's not the case, uh, the, the Assad regime cannot evaluate the, the options open to it for an exit strategy of some sort. And because that can't be done, the opposition also finds it difficult to evaluate where their, their, their future would lie, where, where they could make the necessary mediation um, towards um, finding a better day after future. So my thinking is there are two reasons why there should be um, a very um, a structured approach now to working um, together in opposition. And that is one to do with the day after, because to make sure that there is a structure to take forward. But also, I think, in the, in the reconciliation process, there needs to be a bit more quantifiable um, process uh, that uh, the two sides can see and evaluate against each other so that you don't get a, a win-lose situation, but you get a mediated um, win situation for, for both sides. That would perhaps give some incentive to stop the violence and the, 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 the distinction I wanted to make is that conflict actually is natural for progress. It's violence that we need to stop. We need to manage the conflict to push it into a, um, a, a different mould so that it becomes more productive and allows progress to happen. Uh, I, uh, first, I mean, the point about the distinction between conflict being productive, uh, George Zimmel devoted a lifetime to this, and it's extremely well made because conflict is an inherent issue, the question is the institutional mechanisms that allow conflict to be channeled peacefully. Uh, now, in terms of decomposing, because there were a set of assumptions, let us not forget that the opposition began with the image of Assad as the good czar. So the opposition based itself on the Damascus Manifesto. The opposition did not start the violence. It's the response to a peaceful movement bearing flowers and asking the paternalistic autocrat to embrace them that changed the dynamic. Uh, whether after this intense use of violence against people, the regime can disengage to re-embark re on a path of legitimacy is a very large question historically. If, the, if you look at the closest parallel in that is 1848 and in Europe in 1870, the Paris Commune. But these were decidedly counter-revolutionary regimes afterwards. They did not embrace a wider agenda of citizenship. On the contrary, they went towards great deal of repression. So the one issue is not just when lose, but what is the cost of losing in terms of reassertion? So I would slightly uh, uh, re reframe. Second is 
what do we exactly know about the internal opposition? The closest parallel here, analytically, I think are the Soviets uh, in 1917. Authority has become divided. It's dual authority. Trotsky wrote about this. Isaac Deutscher has written, Ian E. H. Carr uh, is written phenomenally about this and documented it. In questions of dual authority, the site that is organizing is actually unknown to us. We see the face of the government, but we really don't see the nature of the opposition. So the extent to which they have an alternative set of agendas at the local level. If you take the use of the Friday prayer, this has been one of the most creative acts of networking where pooling takes place on the internet as to which themes should be discussed on, on Friday, Friday players. Uh, but the point that comes again, and re-emphasizing your point, the external funding mechanisms vis-a-vis -vis that are important because when dual so power... External funding mechanisms are fixed. Towards Towards, towards the towards towards civil opposite. society. Towards towards the, and it's not civil society towards, now, yeah. because the point, the bellwether here is the role of the woman. If we take Tunisia in Egypt, women were, were among the, the key participants in, in changing these regimes. The more a, a, a conflict shifts to violence, you see marginalization of the woman. So a different set of actors is coming to the, to the fore who are claiming blood. So uh, last issue, you know, I mean, one has to be able to move away from notion of revenge to the notion of reconciliation. And that, I think, is going to be the critical breakthrough when people are going to acknowledge that to bring it into this conflict, a level of forgiveness is going to be necessary, but the critical issue that is missing today is who is going to provide this assurance. How will uh, it work? What dimension will it take? And how will it not be the repetition of, Hama, of, of the 1980s or the recent event? So, and this is again where both the three set of factors. The diaspora, they are in a position, in a, in a very important position, not to further factionalize, but to offer visions. Mm -hmm. The region, so that the dimensions of, of regional stability are understood in the internationals, so that if alignment within those three levels places, I think it will prepare the ground for what you're advocating. Can I do something? I, I have um, some Iranian friends who have started a project which is essentially a, a designed to begin to, to carry out a form of transitional justice in Iran before there has been any transition at all. And indeed, there's no sign there will be one anytime soon. And this is a project which simply records human rights violations carried out by the regime since 1979. It's very neutral, you know, so it's against Iranian communists, against uh, Baha'is against it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a, um, not non secular attempt <coughs> to record what's happened and it's it's actually quite a, they have a website and it's a it's a very elaborately designed project. Are there projects like that in Syria that you could see that could be done now to prepare people to start thinking about a different kind of society? Is there can you point to 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 um, uh, transitions in which people began to think in advance uh, before the transition came about, about preparations. I mean, this Iranian one is perhaps a bad example as there hasn't been a transition in Iran yet, so I can't tell you whether it worked or not. But are there other examples? Well, sure. I mean, South Africa is the, is the most significant example. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Rwanda engaged in its own very distinctive form that initially was dismissed, but subsequently provided the ground because the, the hell that Rwanda went through. But Canada. that was after. Uh, yeah, yes. but they were prepared. That was after the war. But they, yeah. had, but they had preparation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sense that they needed mm -hmm. to deal with these issues and not... I mean, the critical issue to a, po to a transition is the impulse to contain revenge mm -hmm. and the capability to be able to, to deal with this and frame it. 
that becomes a very important driver because it's extremely difficult uh, to get people. And part of this, Spain is the greatest example of producing, in 75, of producing historical amnesia. They decided, literally, not to open the books on the past. Or at least it, to freeze it for To freeze years. it because yeah. it was an amnesia. And Chile is another example. And Chile. Yes, exactly. So it, it is important to understand. You know, there's this balance. Mm -hmm. How much does the past haunt the present and prevent the future from happening versus? Because it can, the balance is a very difficult one, and that, that's where the, the nature, because in some other places, uh, as Claire w was earlier pointing, in some of the African cases and others, strong men with immensely bad records were made into the government thinking that if they came formally to power, they would change. They did not. And it made the peace uh, not stick and not endure. Uh, but these examples, again, as you're pointing out to Chile, are important to be able to come. A sense of historic, and uh, as a Middle Eastern, uh, you know, one of our problems is that every part of the past is still relevant to us. So we easily point out to examples of 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years. And uh, we need a bit of, of the American sense of living in the present. I don't and know if I, you want to go that far. But anyway. I need to add to that. There was a meeting a few years ago that the UN and the World Bank put together of leaders of post-conflict transitions, and all of them said that they wish they'd spent more time in understanding and, and, and arriving at a way to deal with transitional justice. And those who hadn't adequately dealt with felt that this was um, a huge impediment to maintaining the process on track. So certainly it's, it's a key issue that needs, and it's, it's getting that balance between dealing with the past and looking to the future. Um, in some of the early feedback we had on this paper, especially from individuals from Syria, one of their questions was, what, it, what would be the criteria uh, for who can be forgiven or, or, or for, for who hasn't, and, and the importance of setting some kind of inc criteria, perhaps as inclusive as possible, um, for those who, who can be forgiven to allow the society to move on, uh, but also um, as basically, instead of just giving entrenching strong men in positions of power, is there a political agreement to a space for technocratic competence, especially in positions where technocratic competence is really going to matter, um, to get cities working together again, to keep hospitals working, to get the school system um, re-established, and so on. So there were a comment here and then one there. So. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Imad Mesdua. I'm a political analyst. Um, my my remarks aren't really a question. It's just I, I just want to make you, a small you know comment you can about. Make a comment. Okay, uh, uh, you were citing some examples, and I I come from a country that actually went through a post conflict transition, and that's Algeria. I think maybe it might be worth mentioning it because the approach there was something quite original because it was something different to a lot of the cases you mentioned. There was a referendum that was put forward. Uh, obviously, you can debate whether or not it was a democratic one or not, but there was a referendum that was put forward for national reconciliation or uh, or an amnesty. Uh, it came in two phases, and uh, fighters, uh, Islamist fighters who were part of the insurgency, were given, to varying degrees, the right to come down from the hills and you know either give an amnesty, etc. So I thought I'd mention it because it's a different one. Maybe you might want to comment, or maybe it's relevant, or. Yeah. It is very relevant because, again, if you look at Colombia, in Colombia, a convention took place. Colombia is in con was in conflict for 40 years, on and on. And the way they brought it together is that they convened one of the most inclusive gathering of stakeholders in a national convention. And the impact of transformation of that experience has been, has been really fundamental. Because they really had to sit and begin airing their differences and arrive at, at the common path that then has become a very important way forward. In the Algerian example, again, you know, the hell that Algeria went through, the kind of atrocities that happened because of cancellation of the election results, is something that we need to be reminded of. And in all of these situations, is this balance by not forgiving by not bringing inclusion, what is the cost, not of conflict, in your distinction, and uh, Zimmel's distinction, but of violence? Because societies need to, to reach an understanding. And again, it is important to say, 
who pays the cost. And most of the time, it's the poor, it's women, it's people who are denied opportunities. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it's not the elites in these, in these countries that, that pay the highest price. So that, that cost balance need, needs to become very clear, and then the willingness to take a gigantic kind of step. Because part of uh, the issue of peace is one takes a jump regarding the unknown. And there are significant risks to this. Mm. But without taking that kind of jump, routine blocks the, the possibility. And what South Africa, Algeria, Colombia, Rwanda afterwards have shown is that people are able to devise not just one set of ways, but multiple ways to make sure that question of transitional justice. And that there's no cycle of revenge. And that there's no cycle of revenge. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you had a comment or a question. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Patrick from the U.S. Embassy. First, thanks for uh, putting this together and for sharing your insights with us. It's very useful, especially for me. Um, I think dovetailing nicely into the last couple comments, uh, I think it's one thing when, when we look at um, breaking the cycle of violence and looking at some sort of reconciliation between an opposition and, and, and the government and the regime and looking at a day after scenario in which the sides have to sit together and figure out how they work on a transition plan. And I think we discussed this the last time we got together about how you know folks that are part of the regime uh, one day in the day after, they're no longer part of, part of a regime. Now you have to accept that they have some uh, know-how on how to how to govern, how to run institutions, how to be a member of the military, and there there has to be some sense from the opposition that those those folks need to have a role in a post Assad Syria. But increasingly, I think uh, we're seeing that uh, I think as as Assad successfully uh, tries to shape this into a sectarian uh, battle you're seeing opposition not just mount against the regime, but take revenge against what they view as sectarian attacks by the regime on them. And so you're seeing opposition forces, maybe as aberrations now, but possibly increasingly not, against other sects in, that are not uh, outrightly regime members. How do you deal with that in a day after scenario? mechanistically from a Western government's perspective, if you're talking about legitimizing an opposition force that now is seen as committing atrocities or human rights violations, again, granted they're aberrations now, but perhaps increasingly not. How do, how do we deal with that from a Western perspective in, in shaping the, the day after scenario? Well, thank you again, first for the very clear analysis. We've pointed out the same thing. Uh, so in terms of the risk now is identity-based violence. Because that, that is what you've, you've pinpointed. And this, this goes to two issues. One, the regime still has backers. Because this part does not get to be covered in the media oftentimes. There are significant constituencies that still are backing this regime to the hilt, both within the Alawite community, but also within other, other communities in Syria. And, and this needs to be recognized, because the challenge to the opposition is how does it persuade these other communities that if they were to prevail, they have a place. So here again. And, and being able to persuade them the, requires having a vision of what Syria uh, will exactly, look like. Absolutely. Right. Because those people who are engaged in a day-to-day -day set of struggles <coughs> are maneuvering tactically. And as I pointed out earlier, part of their ability to network and gather and coordinate is all taking place under conditions of immense violence. So who actually is doing what part of this violence in itself needs documentation. Uh, 
that's the, the first point. The second point is that the role of the diaspora in terms of offering this vision that and you, we've been saying all repeatedly, is inc inc incredibly, the more the diaspora is seen as divided, as lacking coherence, as being uh, supported externally, it feeds into, into, into this dynamic. The third issue, again, it, it comes to the relevant of scenarios, is that both the Syrian opposition and their supporters, both regionally and others, have an obligation to prepare, to ensure that this kind of perpetuation of violence that is started does not extend. Because even if the regime suddenly were to collapse, you cannot do away with very, very large groups of people. If Iraq is taught us anything, it is not to dismiss organizations like the BAT or, or their others. There has to be a path. If there is a path to inclusion, it allows for stabilization much more rapidly than otherwise. So part of it is drawing lessons uh, we are not good at drawing lessons. Well, I mean, it, it seems like the SNC had to be reminded today that they didn't have any alawites in their exactly. reform. But this, is, but this is the whole point. That if a regime <coughs> is, become, is forced to increasingly shed its outer layers of, national, of its nationalist credentials in resort to an ethnic identity-based survival mechanism, the opposition has the duty of, of bringing an alternative. Because if the, the image is, well, we are going to put you in the gutter, or we are going to exile you, or we are going to be repressing you, that's not what, what is going to bring, bring about reconciliation. Uh, or a kind of stability to Syria that we call the new republic, to be able to, to solve some of the fundamental problems of governance you need to think about a kind of Syria that would have stability, but it would be a stability that would not be authoritarian, that it could become reproduced much more easily than the type of either struggles of the, of the 1950s that resulted finally in the, in the coups, uh, etc. Uh, so th there's a lot to be done. In, I think all actors have an obligation to, to think through a lot more seriously about the questions that you've raised. Uh, we don't have an enormous amount of time left, and I, there's, if uh, one or two people still have raised their hands, but I want to make sure we end on a, um, just for the I sake of- I think there was a, a question here. Oh, I'm no? sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'll, 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 get, I'll get one more from you in a second. I, just, I want to make sure there's, um, we, we end on a, a positive note in, in at least one sense. Um, Claire, I'll start with you. Looking around, you know, from the enormous numbers of case studies you've looked at and transition series you've seen, um, is there a country or is there a situation that it bears some similarity with Syria that had a positive ending that you can point to that you would like Syrians to know about? That, you know, that there, this, there's, there's a similar situation that happened somewhere else that they can, they can see. I think in short, no. Oh dear, uh, yes. <laughs> the, um, but we can look to the glass half full as well as the glass half empty. If 50% of peace agreements have failed, 50% have succeeded. Right. And I think it's looking to those, I mean, we need to look at the ones that have failed to understand why they failed, but to look at the ones that have succeeded um, is also really important. I think normally when um, our institute first visits a country, we're told our country is unique. There's nothing we can learn from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And we've actually found that those in, in, in Syria who've, there's an enormous actually degree of appetite to look for examples from other countries, both within the region but also across the world. So the examples of Colombia, of, of South Sudan, of, of South Africa, of Nepal, of, of, of Cambodia, of a vast range of countries. But I think the real question is to look at what aspects of each of these countries has, mm -hmm. has something to teach Syria. Mm -hmm. can, can, can you answer that? Can you, maybe you can narrow it down to... You know, the, the aspects that Syria should be looking towards a particular transitional justice solutions, towards economic solutions, are there, are there places or examples you can point to? Well, I mean, the, the first issue is next door uh, in terms of 
the two, two neighbors. Turkey became a republic in 19... And don't forget, Turkey was fighting for its life, which is not the case of Syria. The entire international community wanted to get rid of Turkey. But they were able to generate a consensus <coughs> out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire on a new uh, path forward. Hmm. And Turkey today uh, is a very, very dynamic, and again, different parts of Turkish history uh, allow very significant lessons for Syria. The other alternative uh, is peace at the cost, but it's the Lebanese confessional agreement. Hmm. Because if Syria cannot agree on a republic, can it agree on a compact of communities? So the two immediate neighbors offer two, two different uh, uh, po possibilities in that, in that regard. The third is to understand uh, if Sunni domination is going to become the rule then Iran and Iraq both offer very significant examples. Uh, by embracing an identity-based uh, uh, approach that is religious fundamentally in nature, in a country that has prided itself in the past on its secular consensus, what are the opportunities and, and costs of that? So one set of examples comes, <coughs> comes from the, the, the neighborhood. Uh, second, in terms of historical amnesia, producing a consensus that certain things are not going to be open, Spain of 75, Chile, South Africa, offer very, very distinctive uh, set of uh, uh, possibilities. Three, in terms of security institutions. El Salvador and Guatemala, made the fundamental distinction between defense and security, which meant that the army had no role in, in running the government anymore. That the task of the army was defense, not uh, internal security. Internal security. Mm -hmm. And this is a fundamental distinction that can be drawn on because the negotiations that are going to take place regarding the security area are going to be some of the most significant, particularly regarding how an officer corps that can be responsible to civilian leadership and accountable to the people is, is going to come. Uh, role of intelligence. Again, uh, a range of Latin American countries, including Colombia and others. In terms of bringing stakeholders to a common uh, framework, Colombia offers one example. The nature of negotiations, Sudan really offers at that, at that level uh, a kind of approach because the vice president uh, of then United Sudan engaged in discussions with John Garang. The problem, of course, was the length of time. Uh, in terms of a sudden approach, I think uh, the Bonn Agreement in Afghanistan is an important uh, marker in that if there was a sudden opening, all questions cannot be arrived at given the complexity of situation within a week or two weeks. But in a month, an agreement regarding what must follow uh, could take place that is benchmarked. What we did in Afghanistan, which was really quite distinctive was to divide a time-bound series of benchmarks from illegitimacy <coughs> to legitimacy. And that offers, I think, very distinctive things. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the immediate uh, issues of, of reconstruction, post-tsunami handling offers a lot of positive and negative examples. Uh, the International Fund. The but, International yeah. Fund on the one hand, but mm -hmm. also avoiding uh, a swarm of NGOs that are going to be uncoordinated. Mm -hmm. Because you know, people of Syria uh, have a lot of hopes and aspirations regarding the international community. 
if you've dealt with the international community's aid side, as long as I've dealt with, uh, they need to be governed. Uh, they are not capable of governing themselves. Uh, I'll leave it at that because I don't, I don't want to go on a tirade. I, I really want to uh, 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 determine the, the question. Okay. But as a question, for instance, which would be really significant, is a multi-donor trust fund with a unified set of rules so that competition uh, is avoided. Uh, Jane Marriott is here, and uh, DFID was a remarkable partner in, the, in this regard because... The, the Department of, uh, by law, uh, the United Kingdom has a degree of, uh, has created a, a degree of autonomy. Uh, so there could be, pooling of resources is really going to matter. It's not just going to be them up. It's the way resources are pulled together, the way a limited set of programs that are meaningful to the lives of the people are conceived. We did this in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, I had the privilege, Claire worked with me very closely, of designing a program that provided $1 billion to villages directly. Uh, one should avoid the past bureaucratic tendencies that things are over-centralized. We need, for instance, Syrian municipalities could be a great focus of attention because so much of coordination now has evolved at the municipal level. How do we help them shift from running an insurgency to running governments is going to be really critical. In here, there are a lot of networks in Europe. The Eastern Mediterranean Initiative, again, is very good. And one other issue that, because we've pointed out some of the other problems, that the assets of Syria are not confined to Syria. The Syrian diaspora is a very dynamic uh, group in terms of international experience, in terms of business. Instead of focusing just on positions in the government, if the Syrian diaspora really focused on creating the economy <coughs> and generating growth in a credible manner and were supported through the Eastern Mediterranean Initiative and others, those, again, are, are sorts of examples. Uh, last set of examples are not country level, but state level. The state of Bihar in India or the state of Karnataka Karnataka now is a powerhouse. I worked in Karnataka at the time uh, when the chief secretary was being imprisoned for land speculation. I mean, corruption, uh, incompetence, etc., was so rife. Uh, but those, you know, are very large populated uh, places in some of the states of Brazil. Again, in terms of of shifting, uh, offer offer lessons that that could usefully be harnessed. Bihar was. You know, they, they had a word for it. It called the rule of the tax. Because politicians hired tax first, and then the tax threw out the politicians and assumed power. But the type of dynamic that has been created in the last uh, decade in Bihar is, is really brought about significant changes. So if one looks, one can find different blocks. But it's my concluding point is, it is not going to be a coherent one country look that they can look into and say, mm -hmm. we are going to. They need to do the hard work of saying, what type of country do we want? A, a level of agreement on an objective, a common objective, and a simple set of rules. And then the range of experience that are relevant to them to help them mm -hmm. uh, fashion the solution. If the solutions are fashioned for them from outside, they're not going to be enduring. But offering them options regarding how they can solve distinctive problems that they need to own. What is crucial to the, to the transitional and post-transitional period is that they own the problems. The solutions, one can, a lot of external help can be provided. But if the solutions are not, the problems are not owned, saying this is the problem we want to solve. For instance, the problem of transitional justice. Then arranged can, can be helpful. Uh, I think we will conclude with that. I, I heard three very distinct proposals in there among, among many others that, that, that are particularly relevant maybe right now. One was the idea of creating an international fund to manage aid going into the country and to help manage the NGOs. 
Another was working directly with municipalities that are perhaps already liberated or who have already control over their own their own activities. And the third was um, that the diaspora should be working on creating the economy um, as well. And uh, <coughs> strike me as three things that could be done right away. Uh, anyway, I will stop there because we said an hour and a half, and it's been an hour and a half. And thank you all very much uh, for coming on on this early evening in London. And um, thank you. Thank you to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.